Hello, guys, and welcome back to the NW Sportscast. I'm Drew Alba with Levi Coover. It's going to be a really fun episode. Spring training is in full rotation. Everything is coming to a spearhead here. Draft talk for the Seahawks. We're going to play a fun game to end this podcast. Levi, how you doing? Drew, I couldn't be better. Exciting stuff. You know, the Mariners have a baseball game, a regular season baseball game in this month. So I'm just excited for that one. Very, very exciting stuff. Also, March Madness in this month. One of my most favorite uh, sporting events there is. Maybe the most favorite sporting event. Unfortunately, the Huskies won't make it, but your Cougars might. How are you feeling about that? Well, we got another big win today against uh, UCLA. So Washington State, yeah, we're we're ready to make the tournament. Um, how about how about Syracuse? Are you guys, you guys gonna be there as well? Syracuse is on that fringe. You know, if, hey. if we Clemson, we have a chance. But let's talk some Mariners. Matt Brash. There is reports he could be out for the entire season. He maybe would have to go undergo some surgery, and that was obviously super super disappointing news because Matt Brash is arguably the most talented pitcher on the rotation. I mean, he throws the most nasty slider of anybody in the entire MLB. It's ridiculous how much movement he has on some of his pitches. And he looked to be that number two guy behind Munoz. But then it looked like he could be out for the year. However, now he is starting to throw next week, Levi. I mean, the turnaround is absolutely insane. He will probably not be good to go to start the year because he just still has to ramp up, and he just does not have a time right now. Like you said, it is March 3rd. Mariners play this month, and he starts throwing next week, and that's great and all, but he will not be back for the start of the year. But I'm just glad he's going to play some baseball in 2024. That's amazing stuff to hear. Yeah. I mean, Ryan Divish kind of set Mariners Twitter on fire for about, what, a day and a half with his article. Blowing up. Wow. And then, what do you know? It's it. He's going to be back hopefully May or June. And Gregory Santos as well will be there in May. So we'll have to patch a couple holes early in the season. But for the most part, bullpen should be pretty good. Yeah, it should be very good. And, and if you guys want to know who certainly... could be patching those holes, check out my series where I'm talking about every single <laughs> member of the Mariners bullpen. Which I will uh, I'll actually try to make a video about that too. My apologies, Levi. Sorry. But yeah, it's it's been a good series over there. I, I believe you just talked about Gabe Spire. I and did. he's he's a very interesting guy. He came up clutch for us that last month of the year, especially against the Texas Rangers that sat or that Friday game, I believe. Or was the one where JP walked it off? Maybe that was a Saturday game. Um yeah, Gabe Spire threw two huge innings, got us out of a few jams. Spire's a legit guy. But it's nice that we don't have to rely on the spires of the world this entire season. We have Matt Barash back. You've got Munoz. You've got Santos. This will be a really, really good bullpen and a really, really good starting pitching rotation. But you know what could make it even better, Levi? What, Drew? Blake Snell. Oh, is there any poss- is there any possibility? I-, I just want to put it out there. He's still in the market. He still lives in Washington. He still hasn't signed anywhere. Maybe his market's going to go down and we pull the trigger. I'd be down for it. I really would. Well, supposedly we did make an offer for Matt Chapman, but the Giants outbid us, you know, 54 and million. That's great years. news to hear. I'm so excited that we actually, like, at least, I don't know how much we put on yeah. it, but. So at least we tried at Matt Chapman, yeah. which is better than you can say about most of the free agents this offseason. Um, but for Blake Snell, I just, there's no way. You think there's less of a there was less of a way for chat or for Snell than Chapman? Yeah, I do. I just I don't think that Snell is interested in taking a short term deal right now. I think he would sacrifice money for for years, where the teams like the Yankees were giving him pretty good value, but they just didn't want to give him more than five years, and he said no. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe his market just completely deteriorates at this point. It's March first or March second. You're not you're not signing Blake Snell. I don't think so. Someone's got to sign Blake Snell. That's true. Not that I would be opposed, right? I mean, I you, my whole thing is I want players who will make the team better. I don't care yeah. if you know. Oh well, we already have five great pitchers. That's fine. Give me a sixth, and you know, let's move Brian Wu to the bullpen. Like you can do stuff like that. But 
Um, I just don't think it's realistic. So if the Mariners could sign him for $15 million a year, you want to take it? Oh, for 15? I mean, yeah, I would take it. I'm not saying I, I would take him for $25 million a year. I have no worries about the cost. I'm so it's not Blake to... Snell. You just don't think it's happening. What's that? And so it's not about Blake Snell. You just don't think it's really happening. No, it's not. a. I would, like, if I was the owner of the Mariners, I would sign Blake Snell. But I just don't think that it's happening because, realistically, like, I just don't see yeah. that world. Oh, I know what you mean. And the odds right now are favoring the Giants to acquire Blake the Snell. Giants again? Yeah. So the Giants could wow. be, a, you know, another big mover there. The Yankees obviously offered that contract to Blake Snell. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but, you know, the Yankees at one point were minus 200 odds to sign Blake Snell, and they couldn't get it done. And he's still on the market. There's great, great chances that, one of our five pitchers will be out for a long period of the season. And that's just the reality of pitching in the MLB. It's not necessarily me betting against our players. It's me thinking, look, you look at injury history in the MLB, pitchers are throwing their arms in angles that are not natural to the human body. It's bound to happen. And you saw that with Matt Brash. And you're going to see with one of our guys this year. And I would so love it when – um, inevitably we get, we're going to need a six starter. I would love it to be a Brian Wu and not an Emerson Hancock. So I would love Blake Snell. I really would. And if Blake Snell gets injured and we sign him for a four year deal, I still don't think that's a quote unquote bad, you know, it, it's a bad signing. Yes. But I think the ideology and the process is good. And I think that's kind of what you have to base decisions off in the MLB. You make trades, you sign players based off the process and the ideology behind it. Not necess- not always necessarily about what the result of the signing or trade becomes. So I think getting Blake Snell is a good idea, and I'm going to stand behind that and hope that the Mariners make him an offer, and we'll see. Yeah, I will say this. I think there are people both in the organization and fans who are scared because of the Robbie Ray contract, because obviously that didn't work out. But it's yeah, like, what? Like, do you, but but also, that. we traded and we got like, you know what I'm trying to say. But also, Drew, did the was the Robbie Ray contract a bad deal? Because the way I see it, we got him for one year. We made the playoffs that year for the first time in 20 years, and he was objectively he was our second best pitcher that year. Yeah, and we don't have him. We probably didn't make. We made the playoffs by what two games? So there's a chance we missed the playoffs that year. There's a chance the drought is still going on if we didn't sign Robbie Ray. But people act like that was a huge mistake because what? Because he had a freak accident, Tommy John surgery. Like, no, it's a great point. It's you know, it was Ray Day in Seattle. Everyone was like, "Our ace is on the bump." He played a really, really good first year, and then he got hurt. What can you do? You know, but, but I mean, what what you, you can do as fans is complain, 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 and then say, "Oh well, we shouldn't sign anybody because they might get hurt." And that is a small minority. I, I would say it's still a minority of fans that would prefer to not get Blake Snow. A small but vocal minority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Levi. Ugh. Very, very good point. So the Mariners. So we really haven't made our official predictions for what the Mariners season no, will be. Not. And we can leave those for in you know a couple of weeks closer to the start of the season. But I just want to baseline, Levi. You know, okay. I'm not going to hold you to it, but I just want to see where your head's at going into 2024. Where my head is at, um, I think the Mariners are probably the third best team in the West. Not, I'm, I'm not trying to be a hater, just, you know, the Rangers won the World Series and the Astros have won the division for like seven years in a row. So I think we're the third best team in the West, but I think that, if we were in the central, we'd be the best team. And I think if we were in the east, we'd probably also be third. So that puts us what? That puts us fighting for a wild card. Right? Which is pretty much where we've been at. Yeah. I, I think I think we can get there. I think probably Baltimore, us, and the Rangers. That those those are my wild card teams. I'm gonna say that. I think we're a wild card team. So what is that? Like 80, I'll say 87 wins. Don't don't quote me. Don't quote me on 87 wins, but that's what I'm going to say right now. 
see her right around that 87 game win mark, you know, right around 88, 89, the, the, the kind of pushing it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very Where are you at? Where's your head at? So Vegas has us as third behind Texas yeah. and Houston. Um, but it's a close race for sure. Oh, you I don't, know? I think it'll be close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'll be very close. You know, you, you have Seattle at anywhere from plus 240 to plus 300 right in there. And you have the Rangers at, at right around plus 200 and Houston at right around plus 100. So it's all very close. Vegas doesn't know exactly where it's going to go, but they're leaning Houston and then Texas and then Seattle. But I'm going to disagree with you and Vegas. I think Seattle is getting underrated. I think the Mariners are a much better team than last year. So for you to put them as at 87 wins, I, I don't see how you can do we're a better team than last year, and you're projecting us to get less wins. What is the ideology behind that, Levi? Because from my point of view, the one through nine is significantly better. And I don't know where you can argue that, because who did we lose? Well, we lost we Jared lost, Selnick, so we, and we, we lost a third baseman, well, a so, declining so third baseman. Then you look, no, no, let me, fin- let me finish my point, Skip. All right, Skip. So then you look at you look at the starting rotation, and these are five guys that are all outside of Luis Castillo. There's four guys that are young and should improve. And the one facet of your game, which is the bullpen, going in a couple of weeks ago, you could argue, okay, it's probably worse. Now you have Gregory Santos and Matt Brash who's going to play. Where do you see it? Where Am I missing something, or are you just off your rocker? Because one of us has to be wrong. And I don't know if it's going to be me because they could still finish third in the division, but 87 wins seems a little bit outlandish. I mean, take it up with the fan graphs projections. They have us at 86. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you, Drew. I mean, look, I think the we, national media is underranking us. Look at, look at the, well, that's not national. That's the computer. So the computer. Yeah. Well, the, the computer algorithm it. thinks, but, but what I look at is I say, okay, so, realistically what have we what have we upgraded what have we downgraded right we upgraded second base okay we we upgraded designated hitter right mike ford replaced him with mitch garver um uh, huge upgrade i think we downgraded at third i think that's pretty fair um and then i would say we've upgraded in left field or we've upgraded yeah upgraded left field because i think luke Rayleigh's better than kalanick but I think that uh, Teoscar was better than Mitch. So I think we downgraded right field. So I, I look at it and say we've upgraded three, downgraded two. And I think the bullpen could be better, could be worse. Um, but who knows? I mean, we lose, you know, Seawald, Topa, but we get Santos. And then the rotation is the same five. And you're just banking on, again, can they not get hurt? So I think, I think it's a very similar team to last year. I think we might have more upside because we have some prospects that might be ready. And I think we have some players who have had better histories, but also, you know, the Mitches could get hurt in April and miss the rest of the season. So I'm not, I mean, yeah, they could. Well, they have recently, they, they, they have recently shown that they are, they have brittle bones. So, so you're, ba- so you're banking your projection off injuries. I'm saying I'm assuming that there will be some injuries, maybe probably more than there were last year based off the players we have. But I think ultimately we are more, I think we are a more talented team, but a more injury risk averse team. So that's my take. So you think we're a better team opening day? Opening day, I think we're a better team. Although, remember, last year opening day, we were all in on Colton Wong and AJ Pollock. It's a good point. So that's my question. Do you think 2023 or 2024 opening day is better? <clears throat> I would I would still say 2024 because I also think Kirby and Gilbert took leaps last year. So 2024 Kirby is better than 2023 opening day Kirby. Right? So you think 2024 will win less games despite a better team, and that's because of injuries. Yeah, because we're more injury risk. Okay, so so it's just purely so you're just banging up injuries, and, and you think it's gonna be that big of a difference maker? Well, it's a one game difference maker. Because I actually don't think like losing a Mitch Hanniger and Wright is really a detriment to the season in well, the like, same way you it do. It could be. It could be depending on 
does Kenzone step up? Does Marlowe step up? Maybe they do. But I don't could, think it's that big of a down, downgrade from Hanager to Kenzone as it is. Kenzone's the guy Zone that was starting for us at the end of the year last year. Yeah, he was starting for us. <laughs> he wasn't doing much. And, and Mitch Garver, it's like, okay, Mitch Garver could get hurt, but like yeah. last year was Mike Ford. So it's like, this is exactly. This, that's no, that's what I'm saying. So we, on paper, we've upgraded a DH, but if Mitch Garver gets hurt, then who's the DH? You know what I mean? So it's just. You would have not told me Mike Ford would have been the DH last year. That's true. I, I just think like the reasoning behind the Mitch is getting hurt and a couple other guys, maybe too. It's like, yeah, okay, they could get hurt, but it's like their backup option is the same as what was happening last year for the Seattle Mariners. No, yeah, so so you're I'm saying the guys who we got as an upgrade, if we lose them, then it's no longer an upgrade. Then it's back to last year. Yeah, and I think that – so you're so banking on the argument, guys to get hurt. But then the argument that we have them were more talented goes away if the more talented players that we got are hurt, right? Yeah, but you think we're winning less games. One, I, I have us winning one less game, and I have us actually making the playoffs this year instead of missing. So you think we're you think we're just gonna get luckier? No, I think the rest of the teams in the AL. I think the Blue Jays have gotten worse. I think the Rays have gotten worse, and I think that because of but, that, we're gonna be in the playoffs. But control you can control, and the Mariners you think are gonna control less wins than they did last year, but make the playoffs, which in my mind means they're gonna get luckier than last year. Maybe. All right. It Levi what and you I mean by luck. You said you mean luck as in a per game or luck? luck at, no, luck as in I don't think the Mariners – I think the Mariners banking on other teams winning less than 87 games is luck. I don't think there's anything the Mariners can do to influence that. Yeah. Well, you know what they can do is they can sign Blake Snell and then that gets – Okay, so let's say they sign Blake Snell. Are you up towards 90-91? Yeah, I think Blake Snell adds about three wins. Same, I think Chapman would have added three wins or so, maybe four. So yeah, because you're not a big Urias guy, which you can talk on a little bit because oh no no Urias, I I'm all in on Josh Rojas. I I have no expectations at all for Urias. So so why not Urias? Because I know you know he was he was kind of hurt you know in spring training, but he's he's back to throwing infield practice, so he should be good to go. Maybe not opening day once again, but he should be good to go for the majority of the season. What's your big gripe with Urias? Yeah, my gripe is when when guys hit um what did he hit last year? 194. When guys hit 194, it's not super optimistic for me to then be like, "Oh yeah, he's going to be great this year." Like sure, there are players who have a really bad season and then bounce back, but usually when a guy hits below the Mendoza line, you don't really then show up the next season and become an all-star. Now, could he hit 230? Yeah, you know, 230 is probably pretty reasonable for him. Um, but I'm I'm just like, this is a dude who is pretty much the exact opposite of Matt Chapman. Look at his baseball savant page. I'm I'm just pulled it up. Get how many categories drew? Would he have been in the red in last season? So he didn't qualify, but I'm guessing he would be in the category. There's 17. There's 17 categories. How many was he read in last year? 12. Two. Okay. In 2018. In, no, no. That's really, really bad. Oh, red as in red good. Red is good. Correct. Correct. Let's specify that to the audience because a lot yeah. of times red means bad. <laughs> so yeah, specify the co-host. So in 2018, he, he was above average in speed, strikeout with fielding value. Then in 2019, he shows up and his chase rate is elite, but everything else is bad again. Then in 2020, all of a sudden, his defense is amazing, but he's still not very good at offense. Then in 2021, all of a sudden, his offense makes massive leaps across the board. Yeah. Then in 2022, his offense gets worse in almost every category. And then in 2023, his offense shrinks down to being one of the worst hitters in all of baseball. And you're like, well, he's only 26. That's true. He could... You know, I don't know, but well, and it's the the Mariners have had very little success with players that aren't named relievers and predicting yeah. them being good before the age of thirty. 
You can point towards a Suarez maybe, but he's above the age of 30. I think guys who are not proven, diamond in the roughs, the Mariners are not guys that pull those guys out of the fire and put them at third base and they turn to all-stars. Do they, Does that happen for the bullpen? Yes. Does it happen for starting pitching? I mean, not really. So it's it's kind of like the Mariners don't have a track record where it's like, oh, you know, even though even though the underlying numbers say this guy's gonna suck, I believe in the Mariners and I believe in their um their staff and all their scouts into thinking that Urias will be a really good player. So I'm with you. I think that there's just not much showing that Urias will be that guy for the Seattle Mariners. And the fact that you have to rely on Josh Rojas in that scenario does kind of scare me. Something that we haven't really been talking about, though, is Urias and Rojas should both platoon. So that could help them. You know, you you put them in favor. You put them in favorable pitching matchups. You give them off days. You know, let's say one guy went over three and you need a big hit. Then you can move it to a guy like Urias when, you know, Rojas is struggling that night or vice versa. It gives you a lot more flexibility and it should put these players in better positions to succeed. Usually guys that platoon like a Dylan Moore, like a Sam Haggerty, et cetera, they do usually have slightly inflated numbers because Scott Service is putting them in positions to succeed. He's not going to throw, you know, a guy that can't hit lefties and then pinch hit him to a guy versus a lefty. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. He's going to put him in a position to succeed. So it's going to be good that they're platooning, but then you get in really dangerous scenarios if an Urias or a Rojas either fall off, get injured, et cetera. So I'm kind of very fascinated, to say the least, about what's going to happen. I would say this. I'm cautiously optimistic about Rojas because – he was really good for us for about three or four weeks there. Yeah. And I feel like his, I don't know, his issues were less injury related, which actually I'm happy. Like people, a lot of times have a notion of like, if a player does bad, but he got hurt, then they like write it off as like, Oh, well it's okay. Cause he was hurt. But personally, I actually personally, I would rather a guy just goes through some struggles because when a guy is struggling because of injuries, that makes me worry about his long-term ability to then stay healthy and stay productive. When it's just like, oh, he was in a slump, you can get out of a slump. But you not some guys, like, you get hurt once and you're never the same. Yeah. So, personally, I would rather a guy be in a slump than be battling injuries. I don't know. That's just me. I know a lot of people would disagree and, and would rather, you know. And I'm one of those guys. But I, under, I understand the ideology. I am... I'd probably disagree with you in that boat, but I'm not super strongly about it at all. So yeah, now, that's once the guy's slumping at. after he's 32, then it's like okay, he's probably it, yeah, that's true, and that's kind of why, you know, Suarez wasn't necessarily slumping, but you could definitely argue he was over the hill. Yeah, I mean, well, and and I will say this: caution to Mariners fans. Suarez is going to one of the most hitter friendly parks, so he's probably gonna hit 30 bombs next year and have better OPS, better better offensive numbers. And people are going to say, oh, we shouldn't have traded him. And I probably will say that too, but also it's just important to keep that in mind. Like compared to Seattle. So, so to Levi's future self, please keep this video in mind. Exactly. No, you're yelling remember. about how the Mariners should have kept Eugenio Suarez and not relied on Urias and uh, Rojas. But speaking of the future, let's play a game, Levi. And this game is going to be called over under. And I'm just going to give you a stat, a win total, et cetera. And you're just going to say over or under. Okay. Game. Let's get right into it. One of the main guys in center field, a guy that is not talked about a lot for some weird reason. (laughs) That's Julio Rodriguez. I feel like I don't mention his name nearly often enough, but I'm going to mention it here. And the one I'm going to mention is wins above replacement, his war. Last year was 5.3, over, under, 6. I'll say over. So you think Julio Rodriguez takes a step forward in arguably the most important stat in baseball? Yeah. No, I'm bullish on Julio. And also, center fielders always have high wars if they're good at defense. So, Okay, let's move to Ty France. First baseman last year, he hit 250, over, under. I'll do over. 
So, so drive line, drive line gets him up to two seventy this year. So you believe in the drive line ways? Yes. So, so do you think? Do you have anything more about Ty France? Like, do you think he's our starting first baseman the whole year? Do you think he, um, you know, is a guy yeah. we move off of after last year? What What do you think about that? I think he'll be ten percent better, maybe fifteen percent better than he was last year, and. If he's 15% better at the plate and still really good at defense, then yeah, there's no reason to move off of him. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm a big Ty France guy. I always have been. He signed my poster a couple of years back and the uh, Believe. Um, and he's a veteran leader on the team. Yeah, and the Believe playoff run is super nice guy. I feel like his head's in the right place this offseason, and I think he does improve. And let's hope he does, because that's a big position where it's like yeah. if Ty France doesn't perform, this team could be in some trouble. So we will see. Another guy that needs to perform is our ace pitcher, Luis Castillo. Last year, he had 14 wins over under 15 wins. Man, it's so hard. He had nine losses last year, wins. 14 and nine. <clears throat> it's it's so hard to predict because like Felix, Felix won the Cy Young and had like 11 wins. So I'll I'll say over, but. I mean, that's just me being optimistic. Okay. J.P. Crawford, another driveline guy, another guy that could definitely make or break the Seattle Mariner uh, team yeah. going into 2024. He's a guy that really performed well above his expectation last year. If we were playing over-under in 2023, J.P. would have likely hit every single over Oh, yeah. He had 19 home runs last year, way up from 2022, which I believe it was somewhere around 10. It was six, actually. So, I, you know, yeah. that's even low. He over tripled his home run total. Do you think it was over under 15? So I'm going to give him four. Oh, that's tough. It's, I don't want to say under, but I'm kind of feeling under. So you think we, under? And we've taking... talked about this before. I kind of, I think kind of the opposite of Ty I think JP maybe is 10% worse offensively. And I think that primarily comes from just a few less home runs. I think his batting average is pretty similar, but it's okay. usually when you hit six, four, three, six, and then all of a sudden 19, that's kind of an outlier. So I'll, I'll say he maybe gets 11 or 12. So you think he drops seven or eight home runs? Yeah. So like forty percent of his home runs will just drop. It's it's definitely possible because JP it kind I mean, of he pimped a lot. He pimped nowhere. a lot of his home runs last year too. He got he got yeah. lucky on a few. I don't know. I would lean. I think fifteen is a really good line. I I yeah. would stay right around there. I'd probably lean under as well. Luke Raleigh, he's a guy very very interesting. He had a wins above replacement of two point five, and he's a career WAR of two point three. I'm gonna keep it right there at two and a half. Do you think he goes over that? Um, I think if he stays healthy, I'll say over. Not by much, but I think if he plays the whole season, he's a, he can be a three-war player. I'm bullish on Luke Riley. I'm going to agree with you. I think he's about three or four wins above replacement. He's a good player. He's sneaky fast for 6'4", yeah. 235. That's some good speed. Yeah, he's kind of a dog that can play outfield, can mix in at first. It'll definitely be interesting. We're running out of time here on the clock, but I got a few more for you. Mitch yeah. Garver, DH, one of the biggest moves, but one of the least talked about moves, I feel like, in the offseason. In 2023, he played 87 games. Over under 100 games he plays this year. I really want to say over. Can I hold? Can, can, I, can, I, can hold, I come back to it? Um, if no, it was I'll, eighty, if it was eighty, would it change your opinion at all? If it was eighty, I think it'd say over. Okay, so you're right around the eighty to 100, 110. Yeah, somewhere in that range. So you think he will get hurt? I'm assuming he'll get hurt, but I'm. I mean, that's what you're saying with that, because yeah. there's last I checked, there's 162, and so if you're right around eighty to yeah. one ten, that means he's missing about half the year. That's you know, that's that's saying something. I I'll say over. I'll say but it's over. not because it, I think the plan is for him to not catch. So I'll say he gets over a hundred. Yeah, and I think, I think because he doesn't catch, he probably gets over a hundred. But it's not crazy to say he's not going to. Not yeah. at all. If you watch my 
Um, you know, I, I did a play a player profile prediction about Mitch Garver, and I had him at 99. So I had him right below that 100 game threshold. He's played 87, 54, 68, 23, 93 in the last five years. Yeah, he really, so he's really struggled. I wonder. Well, I wonder what the projections. The projections have him at. Where are the the projections have him getting three hundred ninety four plate appearances? So that would be about just around a hundred games. Yeah, a, a little bit fewer. So yeah. Okay, last one. A All guy right. that could potentially win the Cy Young. I'm super bullish on. It's the man, the myth, the legend, George Kirby. Mm -hmm. 172 strikeouts last year. I think he's going to improve over under 200 Ks. Hmm. I'm going to say under. Lot. I'm going to say There's under just because yeah. Kirby's not really a strikeout first pitcher. But if he turns into one, oof. if he turns, I would say Gilbert maybe for over 200 because Gilbert's a little bit more of a strikeout guy, I think. But Kirby, I'll say under. I but would know. Not that's not a diss though. Like. I think Kirby could win the Cy Young with 175 strikeouts because he's just that good at every other aspect of his game. Yeah, and to be devil's advocate, if he proves that one, you know, if he adds that one pitch that can put away guys oh, yeah. on a two strike count, it, it's over for it's over yeah. for teams. It really is. George Kirby is that good. He throws electric oh, yeah. stuff, and he controls the zone better than any other pitcher I've ever witnessed in real life. Better than Felix. Better than, you know, the Iwakumas and all the great pitchers of the world the Mariners have had. He does not walk, guys. He puts his defense in positions to succeed. He's a dog. And I think he'll go right about 200. I'll lean under. But that'll do it, Levi. You want us to tag us out? Yeah, guys. Uh, thank you all for watching. This is the NW Sportscast. If you're listening, watching, wherever you are, we hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And as always, Drew. Go Mariners.